We're in the midst of a series in the book of Ephesians, our true identity. We've gone through the first three chapters, which really are the theological underpinnings for what he's wanting to talk about in chapters 4, 5, and 6. And as we just began Ephesians chapter 4 a few weeks ago, we really began the practical session where Paul is applying the theological principles that we've already been discussing. But the question I have for you this morning is, how important is it for followers of Christ to walk differently than the world? We don't have to be a relatively experienced student of the Bible before we see that God's people have always been challenged to be different. In the Old Testament, the Jews were given over 600 laws some of which were external and ceremonial by which they could be a unique people. But even beyond the outward, external differences, we are called to live morally different than the rest of the world. <coughs> Why? That's what we're going to be looking at today. Not only does Paul give us Four incredible reasons why we should not live like the world lives, but then he gives us really practical steps on how to do just that. So whether you've been a follower of Christ for many years and you need to be reminded of the importance of living sanctified, living holy as to the Lord, or whether you're a relatively new believer, this message is very important for you. See, the Ephesian church, although they were a gospel-centered church, they were living in a society that was carnal and pagan. Does anybody know who the God of the Ephesians was, if you remember reading through the book of Acts? Artemis or Diana, depending on which translation you have. It's whether you're looking at the uh, Greek word or the Roman word. But nevertheless, they were extremely pagan, devoted to this deity that they believed to be God. Uh, they had prostitutes that frequented these temples, and as an act of worship, you could employ one of these prostitutes, male and female, in order to worship this pagan deity. So when Paul writes to this church, he tells them, he implores them, he commands them, walk differently. And that's really what this message is simply all about, walking differently. When we say walking in Scripture, we're not talking about uh, the way we put one foot in front of the other, but more our pattern of daily life. How do we live differently than those people in the world? And why? That's what we want to take a look at today. So if you have a copy of, your, of God's Word, we're going to find ourselves in the book of Ephesians, right where we left off last week, uh, starting in verse 17. And as God gives us the ability, we will hopefully make our way through verse 24 and uh, as you are able, would you stand with me for a simple demonstration of respect for the reading of God's holy written inerrant word. Ephesians chapter 4, starting in verse 17. Now this I say to you, and testify in the Lord, that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them. Due to the hardness of their heart, they have become calloused and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. But that is not the way you learned Christ, assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus. To put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds. Put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Would you pray with me? Father, we do recognize that you are holy, holy, holy. And for us just to catch a glimpse of your holiness would be enough to change us much like the prophet Isaiah. And Father, we would just be cast down as we look up to your great splendor. 
But Father, you have called us to live holy because you are holy. So Lord, we pray that you'd help us to better understand how we cannot walk as the rest of the world walks. How we can live differently for you. This we pray in Christ's name. And God's people said, Amen. thank you. you. may be seated. If you are taking notes with me this morning, whether it's in your application that you've already downloaded or if you've got a bulletin out in front of us, the main idea that I want you to see is, again, Paul was writing to believers. And the principle that we can learn from this passage is simply real salvation requires reliable transformation. If we are genuine followers of Christ, there will be consistent, demonstrable evidence of our relationship with Christ. That would be to have the faith that believes in God that does not come with good works is dead. A dead faith. So if we are going to have a living faith, if we're going to have the right faith, there will be coming with that faith good works to follow. Now how do we know that to be true? We've already looked at that. You remember in Ephesians chapter 2, it starts with Ephesians chapter 2 that we were dead in sin. But God, who is rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, then it goes on to say, by grace you've been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is a gift of God, not a result of work, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. After our salvation takes place, there is a transformation that comes. The Bible says, if anyone is in Christ, he is a... New creation, old things have passed, behold, the new has come. So as we are followers of Christ, and if you've been a follower of Christ for many years, the significance of the changes you have made may have been lost. The significance of who you are now compared to who you were before Christ, I hope is demonstrably different. I hope you're able to say, this is who I was, but this is who I am now. Because real salvation requires reliable transformation. We are not saved by good works. But if we're saved, good works will be present. That's what the Bible teaches. Now, there's two real principles that we want to walk away from after this main idea. And we're going to see this in the text. So look again in the text, if you will. Verses 17 through 19 really give us this first principle, and it's really embodied in verse 17. It says, Now this I say and testify in the Lord, that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do. So what is the first thing that we have to learn from this? We cannot, and I wrote it down this way, we should not follow the example of the world. And what Paul was really saying to the Ephesian church was what? Stop it! What are you doing? You are living for Christ and yet you're continuing to live like the world. It wasn't just like, hey guys, just so you know, we can't do this. He is, stop living like the world. Why? Why is that really such a big deal? Well, you, you could look in a lot of different places. In 1 John 2, it tells us, do not love the world. For if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in them. For the, all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is of the world. So there's a significant difference between who God is and how the world lives. And what Paul does in the next few verses is really expounds on how much difference there is between someone who is a follower of Christ and how they have been changed and a person who is not yet a follower of Christ. There is a significant difference that when we become a follower of Christ, a change takes place. Now you may be asking, what change takes place, Pastor? Pastor? 
I say, I'm glad you asked. That's what Paul teaches us. So look again. In verse 17, he says, Now this I say and testify in the Lord that you must not walk the law. No, must not, or you must no longer, thank you, glad you're here, as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding. So the first thing he's really saying is the futility of their minds and they are darkened in their understanding. Futility, what does the word futility mean? Vanity, vanity, all is vanity. You can remember in Ecclesiastes, that's what Solomon was talking about. Life under the sun, that is life according to the world. The best the world has is just emptiness, futility, vanity, because there's no real substance. But the futility of their mind is really focusing on intellectual dimness, is what I put down first. You can write that down for letter A, intellectual dimness dimness. The difference between a person who is a follower of Christ and someone who yet to believe is their mind is different. How is their mind? I mean, if if someone is not yet a believer, most of them do not yet believe in God. What do we call them? Uh, do you know we just celebrated National Atheist Day? It's April 1st every year. Um, and I don't know if you knew it was a celebration or not, but as the Bible tells us, the heavens declare the glory of God. And only a fool would say, there is no God. But So a person that is not a believer, they're intellectually dim first because they don't even believe there is a God. But what about salvation through Christ? The message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those who are being saved, it is the power of God. That is, that we understand the things of God because those things are spiritually discerned. The natural person can't even comprehend them. So there is an intellectual inability to understand really the things of God. That's one of the reasons why we should be living differently. Because we have a new mind in Christ. There's a second reason that we should be walking differently. And as you continue in verse 18, it says, They are alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them. What does it mean to be alienated from the life of God? Spiritually separated. And what do we call that when we are alienated from life? Death. Yeah, so I put spiritual deadness is a second reason why we do not walk like the world walks. Because we have been made spiritually alive. If you are a follower of Christ, your connection with God has been reestablished. The very presence of God has indwelled you, and you are made alive. That's why we should not be living just like someone who is spiritually dead. We should not be living like someone who is intellectually dim or someone who is spiritually dead. But it continues on, and Paul's got another reason. Look back in the text, verse 18. Due to the hardness of their hearts, they have become Callous. Now, the heart really in the New Testament is the seat for emotions. And what Paul is saying here, that they have hardened their heart. They have become calloused, literally beyond feeling. I wrote it down this way, emotional dullness. Now, I, I would say that as much as we're talking about a conscience or we're talking about the law of God written on our heart, that is an intellectual understanding. However, the emotions that follow that, such as shame and grief over sin, those are something that people in the world rarely feel. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 and 2 talks about consciences being seared as with a hot iron. Literally that a person has become numb, They just don't feel convicted over sin. They don't feel that 
that grief that comes with disappointing God because they are intellectually dim, they are spiritually dead, and they are emotionally dull. But there's one last reason why he goes on and says, they have become callous and given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. What do we call that? Now, we would call that depravity. I, I just wrote down spiritual darkness for letter D in your notes. Spiritual or moral darkness. So we already have intellectual dimness. That is, they don't have the right way of thinking. Uh, we already have in there beyond the intellect, uh, there is also spiritual deadness, emotional dullness, and then lastly, moral darkness. This is something that Peter even talks about. I wrote this reference in your notes, I believe. First Timothy chapter, no, excuse me. Second Peter chapter 2, verses 14 and 15 says, They have eyes full of adultery, insatiable for sin. They entice unsteady souls. They have hearts trained in greed. Accursed ch children forsaking the right way. They have gone astray. They have followed the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved gain from wrongdoing. Just speaking of people living in the world. People thinking up ways to go against God's law. Thinking up new and creative ways to sin. And we should live like that? We should model the behavior because maybe they've made a lot of money or maybe because they're a celebrity, because they're famous. That's it. We'll just live like them. No. Why? Because we cannot follow the example of the world. And we gave you four reasons why. So the next part of this important passage really teaches us the how. The nuts and bolts of how do we live differently than the world. And that's what we're going to see in verses 20 through 24. He says simply, but that is not the way you have learned Christ. And it goes on and gives us some very important steps that we'll look at in a second. But think about this. It doesn't say that is not how you learned about Christ. That is not how you learned Christ. Because to be in Christ is to have a relationship. It's not just an intellectual agreement. It's not an intellectual understanding. But salvation involves a total person. That has to sink from your mind, that long and dusty road sometimes to your heart has to be engaged by your will, and the whole person is made new in Christ. And if you are a child of God like that, you have not learned Christ through walking in the world. You can live in the world as long as you want. You won't find Jesus there. If you have Jesus, you didn't learn it from the world. So the second real principle that I want you to get is simply, we must be following the expectations of our Lord. We cannot follow the example of the world. We gave you reasons why. But we must be following the expectations of our Lord. That is, what he wants us to do. And what does he want us to do? He wants us to live differently. He wants us to live righteously. He wants us to live holy because he is holy. And he gives us some important steps on how to do that. And as you look back at verse 21, it says, assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus. To put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through its deceitful desires. And to be renewed in the spirit of your minds. First thing I wrote down, as we can see in verses 20 and 21, that the way we have learned Christ, assuming that you've heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus. What is this principle that we're learning? 
Do we have to guess what the expectations are of Christ? Because they've already been revealed. That's, that's the benefit. Uh, Jesus is the truth. We want to be like Jesus. We already know who Jesus is. We know what Jesus is like. So the truth has already been revealed. The expectations have already been given. I mean, he's even simplified it for us in one word. Love. Even the entire law is summarized this in one word. Love. Love your neighbor as yourself. That we have been given principles by which we can apply to all scriptures. Well, the Bible doesn't say anything about that. The Bible says, love your neighbor as you would like to be loved, as you would want yourself to be treated. You should treat others. That's pretty simple. I mean, even I can follow that. I, I don't have to have 600 laws from the Old Testament memorized in order to know what God wants of me. And neither do you. The truth has already been revealed. We've already got 66 books, and all of them are good. But they point us to what God expects of us. And it's even summarized, as I said, in many places. So the truth has already been revealed, but then in verse 22, it really solidifies what we should be doing in verse 23, excuse me, to be renewed in the spirit of your minds. So letter A is simply the truth has been revealed. Letter B, our thinking must be renewed. Our thinking must be renewed. So practically, how do you walk differently? Renewing your thinking. You are in the process of walking differently, you cannot follow the example of the world. You must follow the expectations of the Lord. You do that by renewing your thinking. That's the practical application. Think differently. And Paul tells us to do that in two steps. Verse 21 is the first step. Assuming, or excuse me, verse 22 is the first step. To put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires. So what is the first step of renewing our thinking? Laying aside our old, I put it, identity. We've got to think differently. How did you think before you were a follower of Christ? If you wanted to know how to act, who did you ask? If, if you wanted to know what you should do in a situation, where did you turn? I mean, we're not just talking about thinking as in intellectual processes. We're talking about attitudes as well, our mindset. In the world, what is your mind set on? Self, sin, uh, all those things. But if you are in Christ, how should your thinking be differently? We don't think according to our old identity. We don't think about the ways that we used to think. We don't look just simply at what feels good. We don't simply go by what we want to do. There's a higher calling, and there is a different path, and that's what we're leading to. But the first thing is we have to reject our old identity because our old identity is corrupt. Romans 6 says it this way. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. So our old attitudes, our old way of thinking, our old way of judging what is good, what is right, what is wrong, we can't use that old way of thinking anymore. And some of you already know where we're going, so what do we do instead? Look at verse 24. And put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. That new self is our new identity. I wrote it down this way. We can receive our new identity. Think of it like in the book of Romans, if you will. 
Romans is unique because the first 11 chapters are theological. And then the last 16 chapters, 16 minus 11, 5. I did that in my head. Do you see that? <laughs> ben? Uh, that, was, that was, I had it. The last five chapters in the book of Romans really does on practical matters. But the swing verse there is Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Because you remember, the first 11 chapters of Romans, he's already said, this is what the gospel is. And this is the theological understanding of who we are in Christ. Then verses 1 and 2 of Romans 12, starting the practical section, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, Present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good, acceptable, and perfect. So in our process, we are putting on a new identity, a new identity conceived in what? Created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. That we are going to look at who Jesus is. How Jesus lived. And we're going to be like him. I mean, we used to say that when I was, I was in uh, Sunday school. We would have the little bracelets. WWJD, what would Jesus do? I don't know if that's something kids do nowadays. Kids still wear that? Probably not. But it is appropriate in a situation to say, you know, what would Jesus do in this situation? Or how would Christ expect me to act? And that's really what we're talking about is changing the way we think. Not thinking like we used to, but thinking like we should, according to what the Bible has revealed on who God is and how God expects us to live. Now let's review. The main idea is simply this. Real salvation requires reliable transformation. And that transformation is something that is ongoing. Uh, these are present tense terms. Well, the first one actually is an aorist tense when it says reject the former life. But when it says to put on the new self, that is a present tense, a continuing action that we should continually be putting on this new self. Now, the first principle is we should not follow the example of the world. Why? Because of intellectual dimness because of spiritual deadness, because of emotional dullness, and because of moral darkness. So what should we do instead? We must be following the expectations of our Lord. The truth has already been revealed. Jesus is the way, the life, and the truth. He is the truth. He's already been revealed. The truth has already been revealed to us. And secondly, our thinking must be renewed. And how do we renew our thinking, church? We must reject our old identity, and we must receive our new identity. Now, as I close, I want to give you one real reason why this is such an important investment. Why is it that we as Christians should live differently? I mean, we don't have sideburns that grow all the way down as they did in the Old Testament. And uh, most of us may not have beards that are hanging all the way down. I mean, some of you got some beautiful beards. But um, it's not because of a religious responsibility. So we don't have the external symbol of who we are in God's people. But loved ones, we should be different. We should live differently. Why? Why? Well, I, I wrote this reference down in Philippians chapter 2, verses 14 and 15. This is what Paul wrote to the church of Philippi. He says, Do all things without grumbling or disputing, that you may be blameless and innocent. Now, why would he say do all things without grumbling or disputing? Well, what do we oftentimes do? Grumble and dispute. So he says, Do all things without grumbling or disputing, that you may be blameless and innocent. Children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as lights to the world. You remember, that's what Jesus told us to do. Go and be light. Let them see your good works and glorify your Father is in heaven. So I close with this. 
The last thing I want you to write down is simply living differently can make a lasting difference. Loved ones, you are the closest thing to the Bible some people will ever see. You are the closest example to Jesus Christ as anyone might see. How you live as a Christian really can define how some people view who Christ is. So living differently, living like Jesus, living differently than the world can make a lasting difference in the lives of those people who observe how you live. And that's the real reason, because we are left here for a purpose, not just for the pain and suffering of this planet. We are left here to make a difference. And a lasting difference can be made simply by living differently. Let's pray.